In this video, we are going to review my basic search pattern for the CT of the cervical spine without contrast. This study is almost invariably ordered in the setting of trauma in the ER setting for patients coming in after motor vehicle collisions, ground level falls, any sort of high impact trauma, really any trauma at all. Uh, this study is typically ordered and for good reason. Obviously any sort of neurologic injury anywhere in the spinal cord, but particularly in the cervical spine, carries a lot of morbidity and mortality. Very, very proximal cervical spine issues can lead to quadriplegia and very devastating neurologic injury that can alter patients' lives for the rest of their lives. So without further ado, let's get to the search pattern. The first thing I do is pull up the sagittal view of the cervical spine and get to a place where I feel like I'm cutting the vertebral bodies about in half. And the first thing I look at is alignment. So there are a few different lines, spinal lines, that are important to look at. The first one is the anterior spinal line that runs along the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, like so. I just wanna see that all the vertebral bodies generally line up. Then there's the posterior vertebral line that runs along the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies. And as with the anterior line, I just wanna make sure that the vertebral bodies look properly aligned. I then look posteriorly at the spinous processes back here. And I wanna make sure there's not any widening or what we call splaying of the spinous processes that can indicate something called a distraction injury. These are typically either hyperflexion or hyperextension injuries. And these can be very devastating. They can involve the spinal cord and typically there is ligamentous injury in these sorts of injuries. So I wanna make sure that the spinous processes, the distance between them is relatively consistent. You kinda of have to get an idea of what's normal spacing and what's not normal before you have an idea of when to call it abnormal. But I look at these every time these spinous processes back here and make sure that the distance between the two is consistent. The next series of things I look at involves the craniocervical articulation, which is another word for just the joint in the articulation between the skull and the cervical spine. The first of these articulations that I look at is the atlantodental interval, which is the horizontal distance between the lateral cortex of the dens and the medial cortex of the anterior arch of C1. So this is the interval right here, this space. And it should be very narrow, as you see. Anything wider than 3.4 millimeters is considered abnormal. This up here is called the basion, and this is the opisthion, and there are certain distances that we have to keep in mind when we look at these. There's something called powers ratio, which is the ratio of the distance of the basion to the posterior arch of C1 over the distance of the opisthion to the anterior arch of C1. This ratio should be less than 0.9. Anything wider than that, and you have to start worrying about injury to the craniocervical articulation. I then scroll laterally and look at the occipital condyles. The occipital condyles are up here, kind of an extension of the skull, and they articulate with C1. This is C1 right here, and this is the atlanto-occipital joint. The normal distance between the occipital condyle and C1 is 1.4 millimeters or less, anything wider than that, and you have to start worrying about injury. I then scroll to the other side, which is over here, and do the same thing on this side, looking at the distance of the atlanto-occipital joint, making sure that the measurement is 1.4 millimeters or less, and just making sure that it fits in kind of like a like a ball in a cup. It, it sh they should align, and I'm just looking here, and they align up nicely, and this is very much normal. There's another distance to think about, and this is the distance between the basion and the dens, and you might read different numbers in different places, but the number that I've read and that I've memorized is anything less than 8.5 millimeters is normal. I then go to the coronal. I take a look again at the occipital condyles. This is a good view to catch an occipital condyle fracture. So here are our occipital condyles up here. Here they are articulating with C1. This is just the coronal view of what we were just looking at. These line up very nicely. I don't see a fracture of the occipital condyles. So I look at that and then I go a level below and I look at the articulation between C2 and C1. These, actually I'm gonna draw it here to make it easier. These should line up almost perfectly. You shouldn't see any lateral movement of C1 relative to the lateral margin of C2. So these, these should line up nicely, which this is a very good example of normal. <clears throat> While I'm over here, I also take a look at the dens. A dens fracture is something you don't wanna miss. And here's the dens, which is the kind of point of C2. So I look at that in the coronal while I'm in this coronal view. And then I look at the other the other vertebral bodies and make sure they all line up nicely. And this is very much again, normal, um, but I really pay attention to the top here on the coronal view. Then go back to the sagittal. I take another look at the dens, make sure it's not fractured, make sure everything looks okay there within C2. And in this case, everything looks normal. I'm now back in my sagittal view. And I just take a second to look at the vertebral body heights of each vertebra 
in the cervical spine and you catch some of the thoracic spine too. But I just wanna make sure that these vertebral heights are normal. And in this case, they are. I don't see any fracture lines here. The sagittal is a good plane to look at the vertebral body height. So you can also see that a bit in the coronal as well. I like the sagittal a little better. I then switch to the axial view and I scroll up and down the cervical spine multiple times looking at fractures. I pay attention to the transverse foramen, which are here. This is where the vertebral artery runs. Any injury or fracture to this area, you have to worry about vertebral artery injury, which can be catastrophic, can obviously lead to uh, vertebral artery dissection, things like that. So I'm looking at the transverse foramen. Here's where in our thoracic spine. I peek at the ribs. I'll look at the ribs multiple times, but I look at them in the axial view and then I come back up. And then I kind of look at the posterior elements as I come back up. Particularly here's the lamina that run posteriorly in the spine and we get some of the spinous processes as well. And I'm just looking for anything inconsistent, anything that looks like a fracture. And I do this, I go up and down a few times looking at different parts of the cervical spine each time just to make sure there's no fracture. Take another look at the dens. C1 is an important fracture not to miss, obviously. And this C1 looks normal. Here's our anterior arch and our posterior arch and our transverse foramen where that vertebral artery runs. So this is a cervical spine without fractures, but I go down yet again just to look at it and come back up. Obviously I go a little bit slower, but I'm not gonna bore you by going really slow looking at each vertebral body. I then like to take a look at the skull. You get some of the mastoid air cells, the inner ear, or the ossicles here making sure there's no fracture in the part of the skull that we can view. So I kind of divide it up into quadrants and look at everything and make sure that there's no fracture. I then go back to the sagittal view. I change it to the soft tissue window. And this last part of the search pattern involves these soft tissues. One of the very, very important things to look at every single time is the spinal canal. What we want to look for in the spinal canal is anything bright. If you've watched my video about the CT of the head, anything with the central nervous system that is bright, you got to worry about on CT, you got to think about blood. I want to make sure there's no epidural hematoma. So an epidural hematoma will show up in the spinal canal as bright and it's blood. These can compress the fecal sac, compress the spinal cord, can lead to neurologic injury. In severe traumas, an epidural hematoma is very possible. They can even happen spontaneously. It's much less common, but in patients on blood thinners, patients with some sort of coagulopathy, epidural hematomas can happen spontaneously. But I'm looking for anything bright in this case this canal is without an epidural hematoma. I look at it in the sagittal. I then go to the axial and scroll through, focusing on our canal, making sure that there's no epidural hematoma. In this case, there's not. There is quite a bit of artifact. Like I said in the beginning of the video, CT is not the best at looking at the soft tissues, including the fecal sac and cervical spine and the spinal cord. I go back to our sagittal and I pay attention to the prevertebral space. I'll draw the prevertebral space. It's this stripe of soft tissue anterior, actually it extends down further, anterior to the vertebral bodies. I wanna make sure this is nice and thin and it's not overtly thickened. If there's thickening here, it can suggest prevertebral edema. If you see prevertebral edema and you haven't seen anything else that looks abnormal, take a second look and just make sure there's not some sort of splaying of the spinous processes, widening of the vertebral body joints, anything that can suggest there's an injury. Because if there's prevertebral edema, that suggests that there's a pretty significant cervical spinal injury. I peek at the oropharynx, the pharynx, what you can see of the esophagus. Low yield, but sometimes you can catch stuff there. I then like to look at the retropharynx. And here's our retropharynx, I'll also draw this. Kind of runs just anterior to the vertebral bodies. But I focus on this space, looking for edema. There's obviously the feared retropharyngeal abscess that can spread down to the mediastinum. In the setting of trauma, your index of suspicion for something like that is low, but it is in theory possible. So I'm, I scroll up and down looking at the retropharynx and just making sure I don't see anything abnormal there. I then take a look for lymph nodes. There are a bunch of different lymph node levels in the neck that I'm not gonna go into detail here, but I scroll up and down each side looking for enlarged lymph nodes. It's not uncommon. It's not that uncommon where someone comes in for trauma, they end up being fine, but we identify some incidentally enlarged lymph nodes and sure enough, they've got lymphoma or something. So it's possible. So I'd look for lymph nodes, then go down to our thyroid gland, which is at this level. Here's our thyroid gland. I look for nodules, anything that looks suspicious, anything that needs an ultrasound for further evaluation. Thyroid nodules are extremely common, especially in older patients. And I don't wanna miss something that could end up carrying some sort of risk of malignancy or being a malignancy. Because again, we're responsible for everything on the image. I then go all the way down and look at the lung apices. And this isn't the best, I'm gonna window it and look at the coronal here. But I look at the lung apices, because in trauma, you gotta think about pneumothorax. In theory, you could see a part of a lung mass, something that needs further imaging. So I look at the lung apices, make sure first and foremost is our pneumothorax and suspicious pulmonary nodules, 
lung masses, other things to think about as well. You might catch a bit of a pneumonia. There's a lot of things that you can see in the lung apices. So it's important not to blow them off. I look at them in every single CT of the cervical spine. I look at as much of the lungs as is included in the study. And there you have it. That is my search pattern for the CT of the cervical spine without contrast. Again, this is typically ordered in the setting of trauma. So the most important thing we look at is the bones. Don't forget to look in that spinal canal for epidural hematomas every single time. And don't forget about the soft tissues that we just went through, including the thyroid, lymph nodes, and the lungs. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see y'all in the next video.